Stanford University. Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, needless to say, uh, this is our grand finale tonight. I want to thank you all uh, for being here with us. Let me just um, ask uh, those of you who, for whom this has been your only quarter just to uh, raise your hands. And for those who've had two quarters, and for those who've been here for the whole time, why don't you just stand up? <laughs> So I want to just applaud you uh, for your endurance. Um, I was just commenting to Dr. Para, who said, this has been a tough year, and uh, it's like running a marathon, which is uh, bizarrely something I do as an avocation. Uh, and uh, I know that feeling of running a marathon, where for me, every time I do it, when I get to sort of mile 22, there's a part of me that's saying, why have you brought me here again? <laughs> and then uh, when you know it gets to mile 23, I say I could kind of get there if I have to crawl. And uh, when I cross the finish line, invariably there's an exhilaration that you're there and still alive. Um, and uh, almost immediately a sense of wanting to start over. So I hope you who've completed uh, this want to start over. Now, I want to give you a little perspective, um, because if you've um, done one quarter, or one, one, yeah, one quarter, you did in that one quarter of regular attendance every Tuesday night, three quarters of a week of uh, medical school in its entirety. For those who've done uh, two quarters, you've done about a week and a half. And for those who've done all three quarters, uh, that is less than three weeks of medical school. So you may think you've really done a lot, but um, <laughs> our medical students wanted me to remind you that true legitimacy comes from multiplying uh, those three weeks over the course of what for them is about five years, and that just represents the beginning, uh, because that's graduation, and from that comes another whole round of learning that goes on for uh, another five or seven years, and then as I've um, told you, it's kind of a lifetime beyond that. But I, I do hope in all sincerity that we've whet your appetite um, for continued learning, that you have accrued a knowledge, which I know you have um, deeply in a number of really exciting areas. And we want to thank you for coming and uh, being part of this journey with us. Uh, I want to also at this point um, thank uh, Dr. Kathy Gillum, who is um, my senior advisor. Stand up, Kathy. and who uh, has been really instrumental in helping to put this course together. She worked so hard at it um, that she told me some weeks ago she needed to leave the country for a couple of weeks, which she did. She had some time in Italy, but she's come back. And Kathy, although it's not completely done, we do have your three-quarter certificate. <laughs> And, and so your heart will throb. Well done, well done. So last week um, we had a uh, journey through early diagnosis and molecular imaging, and that was purposeful. I wanted you to have a sense of the future. Much of what we've been talking about in the uh, this quarter has been sort of exciting developments that are going on in different areas of medicine, but that have also uh, very much captured our current state of knowledge uh, as well. And last week was about the future, and uh, tonight's presentation is very much about that as well. The whole field of regenerative medicine and stem cell biology is just exploding, uh, and it began exploding around us uh, at Stanford and in California um, shortly after I 
got here in 2001 uh, was my uh, view and decision that we should create a stem cell institute. Uh, we uh, did so formally uh, at the end of 2002, um, and uh, we did it with uh, unanticipated fanfare. We announced it after we had received a wonderful uh, anonymous gift that allowed us to take some very important steps forward, not knowing that the AP wires was going to put out um, for the world that Stanford was about to clone human embryos. <laughs> that was not our intent, um, and we've not done it. Um, but um, what it did do was spawn uh, a tremendous effort, and in California, uh, we've really stood non pareil in stem cell biology, largely because of the generosity and I think the vision of the citizens of California that created uh, the California Institute of Regenerative Medicine, a product of Proposition 71, which I hope all of you voted for, or at least two-thirds of you did, because that's what it took um, to get it started. And uh, it stimulated a whole new field of endeavor, things that, um, quite honestly, many of us would not have fully envisioned have taken place as a consequence, including um, not only the production of induced pluripotent stem cells, a topic that you've heard something about, but even the ability, uh, as was done here at Stanford, um, to go with a few um, genes to go from uh, basically a adult skin cell to a differentiated stem cell, which is really quite remarkable. Um, but stem cell biology is a part of a broader field of regenerative medicine, and we thought it would be fitting to end um, this quarter with a review of that. And we have two wonderful leader presenters um, for you tonight. Um, Dr. Uh, Rene uh, Pera, uh, Rejo Pera, who's with us tonight, joined us uh, in 2007, uh, largely through the avocation of Dr. Michael Longacre. Uh, Rene was uh, up in San Francisco at UCSF working uh, really as one of the few leaders in the world on um, embryology and embryonic stem cells, and we knew we needed someone with her skill set. Michael identified her, and it didn't take very long for us to bring that to rapid um, resolution. Um, uh, her background is that she started out uh, at the University of Wisconsin, um, spent some time at um, Kansas State University, and then moved to Cornell, where she got her PhD, and then moved further east to MIT, to the Whitehead Institute, uh, where she did some really outstanding uh, work uh, in David Baltimore's lab, and then moved all the way back out here to California at UCSF, which is, I've shared with you in the past, a training ground um, to come to Stanford. And <laughs> she uh, passed the test well. Sorry, whoever hissed, you're not getting a diploma. Uh, <laughs> but um, uh, it has been a great relationship. We have a great relationship with uh, UCSF. We're not merged with them, but they train wonderful people, and we're happy to get the very best of them. Uh, which includes Renee, and um, uh, she has been leading and educate, leading our programs in education, leading incredible courses um, for us uh, as well um, in the whole technology about um, production of stem cells, um, and has been a pioneer in so many um, different ways. And uh, we're pleased that she's going to be our leadoff speaker um, tonight. Uh, and she's joined by Dr. Mike Longacre. Uh, Mike um, joined Stanford 10 years ago. Um, he said a bounce around the country kind of thing as well. He um, started off at Michigan State University, where in addition to his skills as a scholar, uh, he played, catch this, on the 1979 Michigan State University Basketball National Championship. Not, not bad. Magic Johnson was on that team, but Mike was there before him, and uh, uh, they were slightly different in height, as you'll see, uh, but um, I gather that uh, for the practice sessions, you were the point guard who helped to train Magic Johnson, <laughs> help him, 
become excellent. Uh, but that was part of teamwork, um, part of learning how to work collaboratively, which Mike did um, as he moved uh, further east to Harvard, where he did his MD degree. And then he did his residency training really at three institutions um, at um, uh, UCLA, NYU, and UCSF. He is a board-certified plastic surgeon, um, which explains in part his interest in uh, reconstructive medicine and regenerative medicine, and uh, came to Stanford, as I mentioned, a decade ago, and has become deeply embraced in the culture of Stanford because a lot of his work goes not only within the medical school, but also in the School of Engineering and Bioengineering. And I remember many discussions with Mike about the uniqueness of Stanford and why it's such a great place to be able to have these kinds of collaborations. Uh, he um, serves as the director of our program um, in regenerative medicine. Uh, he's the co-director of our Stem Cell Institute, um, uh, has really been, uh, in his own way, a tremendous pioneer. And so I'm really pleased that we end tonight's presentation with the duet and duo of Renee and uh, Mike. So I think, Renee, you're first up. Well, thank you. I do have to say that Mike might have gone to school with Magic Johnson, but I do have to say that I went to the University of Wisconsin Superior, which is in the northernmost uh, reaches of Wisconsin on the south shore of Lake Superior. <clears throat> Most people have not heard of UWS, but I do have to say that Arnold Schwarzenegger was there. <laughs> 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 and, and so uh, he got his degree in business from UWS. <laughs> I've always wondered how that happened, but um, <laughs> it definitely is our most famous uh, product from that very small university. So what I want to uh, do tonight is talk to you a little bit about stem cell biology and regenerative medicine. And I'll be focusing on stem cell biology, and I think Mike will really pick up on the regenerative medicine aspects. So what I'd like to do is I'll start with a introduction to stem cells, which I'm sure you're familiar with, and then talk about human development and the derivation of human pluripotent stem cells, focusing on human embryonic stem cells and induced pluripotent stem cells. And then I want to talk to you about what I think the promise of pluripotent stem cells is. And I'll give you several examples. First, in modeling of differentiation, of human differentiation and cell fate decisions. And um, I'll talk about the genetic analysis of just basic pathways of human development and focus a little bit further on human disease and Parkinson's disease. And then I'll talk to you uh, close up with a few comments about pluripotent stem cells and our understanding of cancer and give you a few conclusions and uh, future challenges before Mike takes over to talk more about stem cell biology and regenerative medicine. So stem cells are cells that can simply make a decision. They can make a decision to self-renew or to differentiate. So on this slide you see a stem cell and a stem cell can actually make another of itself or it can go through a series of divisions where it actually uh, divides to form different cell types. We commonly think of stem cells as uh, being derived from adult, or being adult stem cells, fetal stem cells, embryonic stem cells, or reprogrammed stem cells, also commonly called induced pluripotent stem cells, although there are other, are other ways to reprogram to a stem cell fate other than induced pluripotency. So we're going to talk a little bit about human embryonic stem cells and human development and the derivation of the stem cell source. So shown here on the top, what you can see is a human oocyte. It's about a quarter to a half of the size of a point of a pin. You can see that this oocyte or egg is carrying a maternal pronucleus, it's called. The maternal pronucleus carries the mother's chromosomes and when this egg is mixed with sperm in a dish, a sperm will actually inject a second pronucleus, the paternal uh, pronucleus, carrying the father's chromosomes. 
Now on day one of human development, it's really an extraordinary day. Very amazing biology occurs. So if we think about the first day of human development, the two pronuclei migrate towards each other, carrying the mother's and the father's chromosomes, and then they fuse. And as they migrate towards each other, they have to go through a process that we call reprogramming, okay? Now you'll hear this word a bit more again later, but reprogramming is simply that we have to change the programs of these pronuclei. So this pronucleus previously came from an egg, and the genes that were on were egg genes. And this pronucleus previously came from a sperm, and the genes that were on were sperm genes. And in fact, this pronucleus has the DNA even wrapped on a different kind of a protein than any other uh, cell in our body. And so the sperm pronucleus, all of the DNA is wrapped on what's called protamines, whereas the rest of our cells in our body have the DNA wrapped on histones, an entirely different scaffold, so to speak. Now as these two pronuclei migrate towards each other, we have to erase, essentially, the hard drive, the information that these pro, uh, pronuclei are carrying as epigenetic information. So if you can picture a chromosome, this is the DNA in my arm, you can imagine that there's a series of A, C's, T's, and G's that make up our genes. But on top of that information, there's also epigenetic information. So there's modifications of the A's, C's, T's, and G's. And these modifications turn some genes on in some cells, while other genes are turned on in other cells. So if you look at your arm, your finger has the same DNA as your eye, right? We have the same DNA in all the cells of our body in general, but we certainly can recognize the difference between the programs that must be on in our finger versus <laughs> the ones that have, are on in our eye. And so if we think about early human embryo development, essentially we need to wipe the slate clean. We need to clear off this information that's on these chromosomes and decorating the chromosomes. Now this machinery that does this goes along and clears the information, but out of about 100 genes, out of the total 30,000 genes in our genome, the machinery skips over those genes and leaves the epigenetic information intact. Okay. Now this has amazing ramifications for human development. It is because of these imprinted genes, these hundred genes, they know if they came from a sperm or if they came from an egg, and they're only expressed if they came from it or turned on if they came from a sperm or if they came from an egg. Now what's the consequences of this? The consequences are that we require a mother and a father, okay? So very clear consequences. <laughs> if you think about it, there's no reason that in human biology that we couldn't actually put two female pronuclei in here or two male pronuclei, except that to have a complete genome equivalent, to have all the genes we need on or off, we have to have one pronucleus from the male and one from the female. <clears throat> now, as we go on in development, what you see early on day two is that there's the first cleavage division in human embryo development. So on day two, there hasn't been any net growth in the size of the embryo, and the embryo cleaves to form two cells. These are commonly called blastomeres, but two cells. Early on day three, there's a second cleavage division, so we go from two cells to four cells. And then late on day three, you can see that we've gone from four cells to eight cells. And one of the most amazing things happens late on day three, and that's that for the first three days, the embryonic genome has been silenced. There's been no transcription of genes, no production of mRNA. And then late on day three, the embryonic genome is turned on, okay? And for the first time, the embryo makes its own RNAs. 
So it's as if a switch has been flipped. And if you want, I can talk to you at some point about how we think that uh, switch is flipped. But suffice to say that when I look at a day three embryo, I see it as a cell that is embryonic. It's the essence. It has the most potential of any cell that we know. As we move forward in development, on day four, you can see that the embryo has gone on from eight cells to form 16 to 32 cells. And then those cells compacted on each other so that you can't really see these clear borders anymore. Okay, this is called a morula. And with this event, this compaction, what happens is we now have two different cell types. We have cells on the outside that are seeing cells on the inside, and they're also seeing the media on the outside. And then we have cells on the inside that just see each other. And with that difference in location, for the first time, we have differentiation in the human embryo. And so what you see on day five is that the cells on the outside here clearly have a different shape and a different form. These are the cells that will attach the embryo to the uterus if they're in a woman. And the cells on the inside form the inner cell mass. <clears throat> and there's about 25 of those cells. And all of us as we sit here, all, all of our cells in our body are derived from the 25 cells of the inner cell mass. So if we think about it, the potential of each of these cells in here they have the potential to form all the different cell types of the body. Now, on day six, if we go forward in development, as the embryo falls into the uterus, it hatches, and it comes out of a, a hard shell that's shown a little bit here on day five. The embryo hatches, and it invades the uterus, sticks to the uterus, and it sends out projections. Um, but Human embryonic stem cells, when we derive human embryonic stem cells, what we do is we take these inner cell mass cells and we plate them on what are called feeder cells that provide all the nutrients that we think that embryonic stem cells might need. And the derivation of a new human embryonic stem cell line from an inner cell mass takes about 10 to 14 days. Now, I'll just, I love to talk about human development. <laughs> and so I'm going to bring you through a couple more slides before turning again to some of the stem cell biology. So let's just continue with how human development occurs. Here we see the day five embryo with its trophectoderm on the outside that attaches the embryo to the uterus and this small group of cells that are called the inner cell mass cells. One of the things that happens next is these cells delaminate, or they come apart, and they migrate into sheets. And they form two layers. The bottom layer goes on to form what's called the hypoblast, and the hypoblast gets all kinds of signals to make a decision to form the yolk sac. And the top layer forms what is called the epiblast. Now, if we think about this structure right here, what happens when these epiblast cells continue to proliferate? It becomes crowded, right? And as those cells proliferate, what you can think of is that these cells, they begin to push in on each other and they change shape and they begin to migrate into the embryo. And as they migrate in, the cells that reach the innermost surface are going to go on to form the endoderm. The cells on top of the endoderm form mesoderm. And the cells on the outside form the ectoderm. Now, as we, uh, the endoderm actually uh, forms things like our intestine, our pancreas. The mesoderm goes on to form heart, muscle tissue. And the ectoderm goes on to form the nervous system in the outer layers. So if you think about human embryo development, I heard a joke once and I thought it was so appropriate. It's like real estate. Location and timing matter. <laughs> and it's true. Where cells end up determines their fate. 
and when they end up in certain places determines their fate. Now historically, over the last, I don't know, however many years since people have been thinking about human development, and you can see ancient readings on it, we've thought of human development as a series of cell decision, or a series of developmental decisions that result in a reduction of potential, okay? So if we start here on the top, this is a fertilized egg. And as we look at this chart, we can imagine that this fertilized egg goes on to develop and you get different cell types. Until as we stand here, or I stand here, I know that this cell type, if it is a skin fibroblast, when this cell divides, it's going to form another skin fibroblast. So it's terminally differentiated. There's been a reduction of potential through the course of our development. Okay, and so let me just summarize uh, this short introduction. So we have programming and development, and programming is the setting of cell fate during development so that a skin cell ultimately divides to form a skin cell, a muscle cell divides to form another muscle cell. But we have reprogramming, and reprogramming is a natural phenomena, and it's the essence of human development on day one. And reprogramming is the erasure of established programs and the reestablishment or resetting or returning to an embryonic cell fate. So returning to that potential that you can get any different cell type from a differentiated cell. Now, over the years, over the last uh, 40 years or so, a number of variations have been developed to redirect the programs of adult cells to an embryonic cell fate. So one of the first ones was fusion. If you just take an embryonic cell and you fuse it with a differentiated skin cell, the embryonic programs are dominant. They take over, and this fused, fused product is pluripotent. It can develop into any different cell types. We have somatic cell nuclear transfer. If you take an egg and you remove that maternal pronucleus and pop in a skin cell nucleus, you can trick the oocyte into thinking that it's undergoing embryonic development and establish an embryonic stem cell line. That's been done up through primates, non-human primates, but has not been done in humans. But in 2007, probably the most widely used, or not even probably, the most widely used method for reprogramming was established with the procedure that's called directed reprogramming with genetic factors or induced pluripotency. Now, two papers were published approximately at the same time, uh, one by Shinya Yamanaka and one by uh, uh, James Thompson at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. So how do we reprogram skin fibroblasts or other somatic cell types? How do we return to an embryonic cell fate? So what's shown here is a slide from a technician in my lab. And what you see is uh, some skin cells growing in a Petri dish. You can see that they're kind of flat and they extend out. If we add the genes, OCT4, if we overexpress the four genes that encode transcription factors, basically they can go into the nucleus of the cell and direct the uh, production of RNAs. If we add the, uh, if we overexpress these four transcription factors, OCT4, SOX2, CALA4, and uh, include CMIC, but it's not, CMIC is not an essential component. What we see over the course of time from nine days to uh, later in time, 35 or 40 days, what you see is that some of the cells that have received these transgenes begin to form colonies. And you can see that these colonies develop over time. And they ultimately look an awful lot like that HESC or human embryonic stem cell colony that we saw in the first slide. And we have, biologists have 101 ways to look at something and determine what it is. And here's one way to look at these colonies. So every cell in our body has these proteins that decorate the outside of the cell. 
And so we ask the question, what proteins are hanging out on the outside of these induced pluripotent stem cells, these skin fibroblasts that we for, uh, force gene expression? And we see that they're expressing things called stage-specific embryonic antigens. So they have a lot of decoration that looks like human embryonic stem cells on the outside. If we look at some factors that are in the nucleus that we didn't put in the nucleus, so some exogenous ones, we see that those are also being expressed. So at a first glance, these look like they're human embryonic stem cell-like. And then we can take these cells and we can remove their uh, growth factors. So if we remove their growth factors from them, they all begin to differentiate. So instead of self-renewing, they head down the differentiation pathways and they form what's called embroid bodies that are just visible to the eye in solution. And within these embryoid bodies, we can actually section the uh, embryoid bodies and we can stain them for different proteins. And what we see is we ha have cells that are positive for cells of the endoderm lineage, ectoderm, mesoderm. And in fact, we've seen that these cells can go on to form the early uh, progenitors or early cells in the germ cell lineage, the egg and the sperm lineage themselves. And so they're incredibly pluripotent. Now, we can also transplant these cells under the uh, subcutaneously in mice and say, what if we put these cells inside of, a, of, a, of a, the body in vivo? And what we see is that they go on to differentiate to all of the major germ lineages, the endoderm, mesoderm, and ectoderm. They form neurons, cardiomyocytes, um, liver, many, many different cell types. And again, they also form cells of the germ cell lineage, the egg and sperm themselves. Now, what is the use of this? So it's, it's been, I have to say, it's a fascinating, amazingly fascinating time to be in science. I could tell you a story about my early career. I started out as a bookkeeper at a Ford dealership. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm always amazed that I'm standing before you. Um, but uh, I, didn't, I didn't think I liked school very much. <laughs> and so uh, what did I do? I spent the next you know, 30 years in school. Um, but <laughs> it's an amazing time. It's truly, truly, truly amazing scientifically. So what is the usefulness of this? Well, there's basic science applications. If we want to understand our own development, for the first time we have a system where we can look at embryo development embryo using embryonic stem cells or induced pluripotent stem cells, and we can say, what does this gene do? We can overexpress it, we can silence it, we can differentiate the cells, and we can begin to find out amazing things about our own development. I often say <clears throat> that when I looked at science, maybe why I wasn't so interested in science early on was most of what I was taught had to do with outward science, things like uh, sending men to the moon or rockets or rovers to Mars and those types of outward explorations. But when I think about science, I'm totally amazed about, I'm totally amazed and very fond of thinking about the inward exploration. How do our cells develop? Isn't it amazing that we start out as a fertilized egg and you can get all this diversity? And so one of the most amazing, not to overuse the word amazing, but um, one of the most exciting, to throw in a different word, um, it, uh, applications of stem cell biology is learning about our own development. And in my lab, we've, be, we've begun to use these cells to understand one of the first cell decisions, and that is early in development, as we're going through development, you see another pictorial of our own development, about the time of gastrulation, when we're setting aside the endoderm, mesoderm, and ectoderm, about four cells leave the embryo. They physically leave. They migrate off and form their own little cluster. And these cells are what are called the primordial germ cells. And ultimately, after 10 or 11 weeks, they're going to make the journey back into the, um, the fetus at this point. They're going to migrate up the hindgut, up the midgut, cross the midgut, 
and they're going to find the immature ovaries and testes and invade them and proliferate to develop the germ cells or the eggs and sperm of the next generation. Well, this is an amazing, amazing thing, but it also has much to do about our pathology. If we think about um, uh, the major causes of birth defects, they arise in the egg and the sperm. And in fact, humans are notoriously poor <laughs> at reproduction relative to other species, so that there's many errors. There's much embryonic uh, loss and fetal loss. And so if we've wanted to understand some of the fundamentals of this early decision to set aside a germ cell lineage, the small little cluster of cells, from the cells that are going to go on to form our, what's called our somatic body, or the rest of the cell types. And so using human embryonic stem cells, we had a paper in the end of 2009 in Nature where we demonstrated that we could um, use human embryonic stem cells to differentiate to the early cell types that will form the egg and the sperm. And we could turn on and turn off some genes, these DAS genes here. We could turn them on and turn, turn them off, and we could essentially these show that these genes act as a rheostat of the germ cell numbers in human development. And so we constructed the tools to differentiate the cell type so we can begin to probe its fundamentals. We isolated the cells for the very first time. These are cells that usually develop in our bodies between days 10 and the 10th week. This is a inaccessible time to study. <laughs> um, we isolated the cells and we're able to look at them. We're able to look at what genes are expressed, what proteins are on them, how they respond to growth factors. Um, we can also look at how they respond to chemicals in the environment. And we've shown recently that certain uh, toxins in tobacco smoke um, actually kill these cells preferentially. <laughs> and so there's a what's called a grandmother effect. Um, you can, we can look at our epigenetic modifications. How are you setting these set sperm-specific and egg-specific proteins or programs that ensure that we have a mother and a father? Um, and many other things. Now, we were also even able to show that we could make the male cells go through what's called meiosis, and we can get a haploid cell that looks an awful lot like a sperm. But there were complications when it came to the female, okay? And the complication is this very, very simple one. The cells arrested. They went so far in development, and they stopped. Okay? And so what we did was we came up with a strategy to mature these cells by providing the environment that they need. So we took embryonic stem cells. We differentiated them in EBs. We essentially made what we call green eggs because we expressed <laughs> a certain protein that's green. We took those green cells, we coaggregated it with fetal mouse uh, ovary, transplanted these to the kidney capsule, and a graduate student that just went off to UCSF. <laughs> um, <laughs> unfortunately, for his postdoctoral work, uh, demonstrated that within these transplants, if you section it, we've made eggs. And we've made eggs because we see that they're positive for the green protein, which is showing brown here that has this remarkable uh, structure that is a uh, uh, follicle that encases the egg. OK, so that's one application. What are, the other, what are other applications? Well, I think one of the most amazing applications as we also think about it is that all of us carry different genetics. And if we can make induced pluripotent stem cells, and we can from anyone in this room, we can begin to uh, ask fundamental questions about human disease. And so we have begun to do that. We have collected uh, skin biopsies from about uh, 50 different people. And many of these skin biopsies came from people that had Parkinson's disease, OK? So some of these people had very early onset genetically determined Parkinson's disease. So they had particular mutations. And if you inherit that mutation, for sure, you're going to get Parkinson's disease. It's dominant in its early onset. So very severely affected. Some of the people had sporadic Parkinson's disease. If they look at their family members, if we look at their genetics, we don't understand 
why they got Parkinson's disease. And other people uh, were basically wild type, or they were the unaffected controls. They did not have any history of Parkinson's and did not show Parkinson's disease. So we took some skin fibroblasts from two people, <clears throat> HUF4 and HUF5, for human fibroblast donor 4 and human fibroblast donor 5. Human uh, HUF4 actually had an early onset Parkinson's mutation, and HUF5 is his unaffected sister. Now we took um, uh, these skin biopsies and we reprogrammed them. So you can see the fibroblasts here. And amazingly, <laughs> after about 25 days, you can see that you, we have an embryonic stem cell-like colony from this person carrying this uh, <laughs> disease mutation, Parkinson's disease mutation. And here's his sister. We have uh, uh, induced pluripotent stem cells that look an awful lot like embryonic uh, stem cells from his sister. We did a bunch of tests. Again, now you're all familiar with all the tests we can do. We show that in vivo in a mouse model. If we inject these cells, they can form all the different cell layers of the body. And we, we in fact, show that uh, also in vitro and in vivo, they can form neurons. Now, let me just say in Parkinson's disease, the disease is caused or thought to be caused by the loss of a particular neuron class dopaminergic neurons in the midbrain, the human midbrain. OK, so one of the things we wanted to look at is, can these cells from this severely affected individual form tyrosine hydroxylase positive or dopaminergic neurons? And so we differentiated the cells, and we showed that they're posit we get a, about a 20% yield, 10 to 20%. It varies from experiment to experiment yield of tyrosine hydroxylase positive neurons or dopaminergic neurons. And we can go in and we can look at these neurons and we can ask the question, are any of these the midbrain class of neurons? So within your body, I think, Mike, you probably know this, but I think there's about 200 different types of neurons. That's a medical school question. <laughs> there's about 200 different types of neurons. And this is one class, midbrain dopaminergic neurons. When, you, when these neurons are destroyed, Parkinson's disease is actually one of the uh, diseases that can occur. We looked, we differentiated these cells, these induced pluripotent stem cells from this person carrying this severe mutation, and we showed that these iPS cells follow what we think are natural pathways of development. So they start out as pluripotent stem cells, then they go to a general neural fate, and then finally they end up uh, with a fate that looks an awful lot like a mature neuron. And in fact, this is probably one of my, this is, uh, every scientist says, this is my favorite slide. <laughs> um, this is my most recent favorite slide. Um, and so if I look at this slide, what you see is that in, within this uh, dish of differentiating neurons, from this person with severe Parkinson's disease, we can pick up a difference between the neurons, the dopaminergic neurons from him compared to his sister and compared to other controls in the population. And what we see is we see accumulation of two proteins. One is called alpha-synuclein and the other one is called ubiquitin. And these are proteins that commonly accumulate in Parkinson's patients in what's called Lewy bodies. Okay. Now, these are not Lewy bodies because Lewy bodies are very big. But we definitely see the origins of accumulation or formation of protein complexes that are indicative of differences between the severely affected individual and his sister. <clears throat> OK, so let me just. Uh, move forward with a couple slides having to do with pluripotent stem cells and our ability to begin to understand cancer. So when we, we published a paper with Mike Clark, Mike Clark's the last author, it was beautiful work that came out of his lab that examined some of the programs in what's called a cancer stem cell and an embryonic stem cell or an induced pluripotent stem cell. And what we see is that there's many genetic and epigenetic similarities between cells that are cancer stem cells and cells that are natural embryonic cells. 
they tend to do what's called karyotypic evolution. So if we grow cells in the dish in the lab, they tend to gain and lose chromosomes. We don't have them exactly under the right conditions, but what we see is that they get, gain and lose genetic information. And both cell types appear to be able to adopt multiple fates associated with not necessarily just genetic information, but also <clears throat> differences in epigenetic genetic information. In addition, when we look at pluripotent stem cells and cancer, we see that there is the ability in when we differentiate embryonic stem cells to make cells that look pretty tumorigenic. In fact, that's one of the inherent difficulties of our job. And then finally, we know that within a skin biopsy, we might look at this and think that we have just obtained a fibroblast sample from a person, but there's differences within that skin biopsy. Some cells can reprogram and some cannot. So let's look at this just a little bit closer. <clears throat> so a, a postdoc in my lab, Sean Chavez, she made some human embryonic stem cell lines that she called HSF 7, 8, 9, 10, 12, and 13. And what she found is that these lines differed in their ability to quickly turn off pluripotency genes. So imagine that this is a pluripotent stem cell and you want to differentiate it. What you would prefer is that cells make clean decisions, right? It's pluripotent, it shuts off pluripotency genes, and it enters a differentiation pathway. But instead what happens with many human embryonic stem cell lines is they're pluripotent, they begin to differentiate, and they're still expressing a lot of markers of pluripotency, including this one that's called HTERT, human TERT. And what this is saying to us is that many embryonic stem cells look a lot like cancer stem cells. They have differentiation programs going on, but they're carrying a lot of other information that is more commonly uh, associated with embryonic stem cells. <clears throat> we also have seen that if we take a skin biopsy, we can actually stain a skin biopsy for this protein called SSCA3. And what we see is that some cells are actually positive and some are negative. And if we add these four transcription factors that are able to reprogram cells, what we see is that only the positive cells reprogram. So within our normal skin, we have cells that are able to be reprogrammed and those that are much more resistant. And when we differentiate the, when we uh, reprogram cells from our skin biopsies, we see that we produce many different kinds of colonies and the colonies are associated with subpopulations and yet only one population leads to pluripotent stem cells must in some way be primed towards uh, forming pluripotent stem cells that are karyotypically normal and able to contribute to all of the cell types of the body, endoderm, mesoderm, and ectoderm. <clears throat> okay, so with that, let me give you a couple of slides and then take a couple questions while um, Mike gets set up. So first, I really want to emphasize that Human development encompasses reprogramming and programming in the first few days of life. So the first step on day one, two nuclei migrate towards each other, they fuse, the maternal and the paternal chromosomes are joined together, and then there's a process of erasing the information from the previous generation and starting the program. The program, I would say, really gets uh, jump-started on day three when transcription comes on for the very first time and we can look at an embryonic cell and we can recognize that these are the programs of an embryonic cell. Human pluripotent stem cells hold great promise. I uh, have given you a few examples for studies of development in human pathology. And the promise is probably best realized with a combination of human embryonic stem cells where we have the natural programs from the human embryo and through reprogramming toward, for, towards pluripotency to represent the genetic variations that we have in a human population. <clears throat> we have unprecedented tools. This is such a fundamentally different time in human biology than we've ever seen before. 
We have a sequenced human genome. We have pluripotent stem cell lines that can be efficiently derived from any person to ask questions about our development in general or our development specifically for each of us. And then we have what's called recombinant technology. We can fix genes. Not as efficiently as we'd like, but we can do it. We have the potential, probably the most interesting question to me as I enter my next marathon <laughs> is, we have the potential to probe fundamental questions about human biology. And to me, one of the most fundamental questions is, what's the basis of sporadic disease in the population? And so we have a hypothesis that we think much of sporadic disease arises during embryo development. And the reason we think that is um, we, we know that there are examples of disease that arise in children that are born through in vitro fertilization versus in the natural population. And this suggests that one mechanism for disease to arise is through uh, changes in these epigenetic reprogramming programs early in development, okay? So how does this hypothesis play out? Well, why we started looking at Parkinson's disease for our, um, to probe the fundamentals of human disease is because Parkinson's disease is thought to be cell autonomous. The dopaminergic neurons are the neurons that die. I'm still uh, reading the literature, I'm a little bit, I, uh, I think it's a little iffy as to whether or not other cell types are feeding in or affecting the death of the dopaminergic neurons, but it's the cell autonomous death of dopaminergic neurons. If we can go into a dish and recognize the signs of Parkinson's disease in a dish, we have a platform to ask, is Parkinson's disease in people who are sporadic for Parkinson's, is it hardwired? Is it in their genetics? So we take a fibroblast sample from them, we reprogram it, and every time we make dopaminergic neurons, they get signs of Parkinson's? Or is it soft-wired? Is it actually in the epigenetic programs or developmental or environmental in nature in that we can reprogram away that Parkinson's disease by creation of uh, induced pluripotent stem cells? And ultimately, I believe this is a fundamentally different time with unprecedented tools and potential because we have the ability to impact human health uh, and common problems that affect uh, women and men, whether we're talking about reproductive health, where we begin to learn more about our own development so we know the normal programs or the uh, healthy programs and the um, pathological programs somatic health, neurodegenerative disorders, autoimmune disorders, cardiovascular. We have tools now to look at these uh, questions regarding somatic health in a little bit of a different way than we've ever had before. And then we have, uh, obviously, I think we have the ability to make some discoveries in the realm of cancer. <clears throat> but we have major challenges, major, major challenges. So number one is, I would say, we understand few of the rules of human development. The book of life has not ever been really open too much to us. We haven't probed it fundamentally very well. So if you start out with an embryonic stem cell and you want to make a dopaminergic neuron, I told you in our best results we get 10 to 20 percent of the cells obeying our driving uh, growth factors and forces. So we don't know exactly how to direct cell de decisions, but we have the tools to begin to learn. And I've, as I think about you know, information technology and bioinformatics, our ability to probe the pathways as we differentiate cells is really amazing. We haven't done some things that are the real obvious things, and that is to optimize the environment that cells differentiate in, either through optimizing the cell surface in the dish or adding different growth factors, cell-cell interactions. But as I said, location and timing in the body de de actually determine how uh, cells develop, how we develop, and we haven't really uh, begun to get all of that information together. 
We have often, as scientists, we've taken human embryonic stem cells or induced pluripotent stem cells and taken <clears throat> quite large quantities of them, differentiated, and then smashed up the entire mixture and said, what happened? <laughs> OK, so we haven't analyzed single cells. What happened in this cell? What happened in that cell? So we have more population averages, which would be equivalent of saying, what did each of us, on average, do today? <laughs> so it doesn't give us a lot of information about what each of us did. And then we need to be able to diagnose fate. So when we take human embryonic stem cells or induced pluripotent stem cells, we differentiate them and we transplant them. I told you my story about the egg. I showed you an egg that formed. That was one in 100,000 cells did that. So the other 99,999 sounds like a song. Um, <laughs> they did something completely different, and it was unexpected. <clears throat> Um, we need to enhance our efficiency of reprogramming. If I start out with a skin biopsy, uh, no more than about one in a thousand, one in a hundred cells will reprogram. And then finally, uh, two things is we need to be able to see disease in a dish. So when we think about disease in the human population, cardiovascular <coughs> disease, uh, autoimmune diseases, diabetes, we have to know how to recognize disease in the dish if we're going to optimize our tools, whether it be for pharmaceutical screening purposes, for understanding, number six, the origins of sporadic disease, or for making cells uh, for transplantation. We need to understand what the disease state looks like in a dish versus in the body. OK, and with that, I'll um, end this talk with a quote that I've shown a number of times, but. I can never find a better one, and that is the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. And I think that's very appropriate for human development. Thank you. I think I can take a question or two. If you have any burning questions, yes? Is a pluripotent cell that you would use for somebody, it's, it's uh, autologous to the patient, right? Induced pluripotent stem cells. They are induced pluripotent stem cells would be autologous to the patient. And they're even being made, and I don't know if Mike's going to show you, they made them without putting transgenes in. So in the examples I showed, we pretty much drove the uh, induced pluripotency by slamming in some genes right into the chromosomes and forcing their expression. Mike's used a milder method <laughs> with a different set of tools. Okay. Uh, Professor Rea Cofera, you mentioned location and function, the relationship. How much time do we, do you have on the early uh, dividing to examine the function and the location that will develop into, and, and what can we do about it? So I think um, there are some tools we need. So we need to go to single cell analysis and really get a complete picture of what a cell is doing over time. There are a couple ways, I didn't show you a video, but one way to look at differentiation goes back to the old days, and that's to look at cells. What's their shape? What's their behavior? Can we tell when they've made decisions by what they're doing in a dish? And then we can begin to uh, correlate time-lapse imaging with molecular programs. We can capture that cell, and we can say, this cell looked like it was beating. Okay, <laughs> for example, very, very crude example. And then we pick that cell and we verify, yes, that's the signs that that cell entered this pathway and is a cardiomyocyte or went down the cardiac lineage. What we, so what I was saying was that in general, we've done these where you grow up large numbers of cells and you get an average of what the cells did. But we don't know how they make specific decisions. 
you can imagine that you decide to go to the grocery store, okay? How did that happen? <laughs> there was some, some information that you got, <laughs> the milk was empty, <laughs> the, whatever, and you went to the grocery store. Well, we don't actually know the, the precipitating factors that actually lead a cell to do something. And I think uh, one of the, uh, there were a couple of reasons why, um, other than Mike's charm, that I was able to <laughs> move down to Stanford, but one of them is the incredible tools that are available here through engineering and bioengineering in combination with stem cell biology to pick up, it sounds very simple, but as you're differentiating cells, you need to pick them up, you need to look at them, and you need to analyze them and see what it, you can imagine that if we think about the cells in our body, if there's 216 different cell types and 200 neurons, what we'd like to do is write the book. How do you get from here to here? There's a pathway. And if we look around the room, we know that pathway is pretty high efficiency <laughs> and quite perfect when we look at our, our uh, bodies and the way that we're made up. There's distinct rules. Yep. Did you say that uh, the test tube uh, embryos had some diseases that uh, others did not? And yeah, there's a, begin there's a few papers. Um, they're rare things, but they're interesting because of what they, they, these little rare examples show. So there's this cluster of, uh, there's these 100 genes that are imprinted. And in the first day of in, uh, development, if this is an imprinted gene sitting in the middle of this chromosome, there's a machinery that goes along and demethylates all the regular genes and then hops over the imprinted one and moves on. Okay. You can look at these genes in children that were born of IVF and in some cases that methylation is different. So there were some errors in the culture period. Now um, these are relatively rare but they suggest that that early stage of development is either susceptible to the culture or remember um, the other possibility is that the people who showed up had differences in their egg and their sperm programs. So one of those two things probably is actually going on. Could you just take one more question? Okay, one more question. Yes. Uh, so you mentioned from Parkinson's that some cells in the middle of the brain died. Um, for most people, that doesn't happen until they're 40 or older. Yep. Uh, Could so you repeat the question? Yep. Okay. okay. Uh, so for those people who are, so basically those people have had good cells for 40 years, good good enough where they didn't get Parkinson's. So would it be possible uh, through embryonic stem cells then to regrow those mid midbrain cells and just treat those people so that they keep getting a refill? Okay. So. This is the parts replacement <laughs> hypothesis over here. So he asked if you take, uh, uh, you know that people with Parkinson's are losing their dopaminergic neurons. Can you just grow up some more dopaminergic neurons for people that are affected with Parkinson's? Um, and so it's likely that we don't need the end product. So if you think about, if I, am, if I say to you, and I am, tomorrow I'm going to Paris, right? There's a, uh, a route to Paris, but what we'd like to do uh, in the analogy to stem cells is we'd like to capture the stem cells before they reach Paris on the way. And we could say, this is a cell that's determined to get to a certain point. And the reason is, if you think about your brain, it, and I'm not a neurobiologist, this is just my way of thinking about my brain, is that what is, appears to be doing most of the time <laughs> is firing and neurons are interacting. If we, put in, if we try to put in new neurons, they may not integrate into the system appropriately. But if we can put in immature neurons, step back a little bit, they may have more potential to send out um, uh, projections and integrate into the brain. And that's been shown in some animal models, that you need a neural stem cell or a progenitor to the dopaminergic neurons for any sort of a transplantation model. But obviously, if you're talking about stem cell therapies for um, brain disorders, neurodegenerative disorders, 
this is one of the hardest things that one could think about accomplishing with stem cells, is to actually put them in the brain and have them integrate correctly. Thank you so very, very much. Now Mike Longacre is going to give exactly the same talk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> in an amazing fashion. I'm sure it'll be amazing, <laughs> but maybe we want a different talk. <laughs> it's very large. Okay, th uh, thank you, Renee. Um, I'm, uh, well, first, I'm going to start with a disclosure so you can determine if I'm biased in this talk, and I'll tell you when you can make that decision. It's obviously, <laughs> well, I mean, anytime you want, but I'll tell you when I think it, it could be appropriate. It's always a tough act to follow Renee, and now you see why the opportunity to move her 32 miles south of UCSF was fantastic. So. I'm going to talk about three things today. Um, one is how we repair. So I'm going to talk about reparative replacement or regenerative medicine. One is how you heal a wound, two of which really don't have anything to do with stem cells. But the concept of how will regenerative therapies impact your life is something I'll try to explain tonight. So how we repair, then getting stem cells from an adult, because they're in each of our organs, and what you can do with those. And then third, how you might use small molecules to prevent birth defects in truly a regenerative fashion. So first thing is I don't work alone, just as Renee talked about. We lots of investigators uh, in a uh, children's surgical research program. Peter Lorenz is a pediatric plastic surgeon. Tom Crummel is a pediatric surgeon, the chair of surgery. Joel Helms is a developmental biologist and a dentist who works on how the face patterns. Carl Sylvester is a pediatric surgeon who works on how the liver regenerates. You might not know that you can remove about 90% of the liver in a body. It'll regenerate to 9% of the body weight as long as it's still getting blood supply from the gut. So there's a spectacular example of regenerative medicine postnatally. Jeff Gertner is a plastic surgeon um, and microvascular surgeon, and George Yang is a general surgeon. So the first thing is, what you probably don't realize is 80 million times a year in the United States, a scalpel is laid down on a patient in an incision for an operation. All of those, God willing, heal with a scar. That is, we don't regenerate without a scar. We heal with a scar. 275 million operations in the world each year all in with a scar. You might not know, and I'll, and I'll emphasize it, that we are the only species on Earth that heals with thick scars. You thought a pierced earlobe becoming a golf ball sized tumor, so called keloid, only happens in humans. We are special relative to other species on Earth. But about 15 to 18% of the time, for everyone in this room, you could develop a thick scar, a hypertrophic scar. Now, it doesn't grow beyond the boundary. If I have a cardiac bypass surgery, the scar would be thick like a pencil here, but a keloid would grow beyond the boundary like a benign tumor. So we, we have a unique ability to overheal, and one could argue that evolutionarily, we've evolved for speed and repair. If you healed slowly, you were selected out with infection, or you never uh, stopped your blood flow or whatever. So scars are great, and they're better than not having a healed wound, but they don't look or function like normal tissue. So the question is, how as a plastic surgeon, how we might move this needle towards skin regeneration? And this is an... Uh, an experiment I did uh, at UCSF, our, 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 our farm system, so to speak, uh, up north. Um, this is a mid-gestation embryonic lamb, still on the umbilical cord, sterile operation. A big defect in the upper lip, like you would have in a cleft type defect, was closed, put back in mom, and here we are, you still see a marking suture here three weeks later. If it weren't for that, you'd have a hard time finding that wound. Now, wouldn't it be great if children and adults, we could do something postnatally for the six billion of us who walk around outside the uterus, which was an elegant sandbox as we describe as Renee, wouldn't it be great if we could heal like this? That would be fantastic. 
And what's always puzzled me, as Renee said, is up to the third trimester in any animal models we've looked at, you heal without a scar. In the third trimester, whether you're human or mouse or rabbit or monkey or pig or sheep, you name it, you begin to scar. And the question is, as she so elegantly said, the DNA hasn't changed. What's different about your healing process? Now, there's lots of things that could be different, but the only question is, how do we make us heal more like we used to heal? It's hard to imagine peaking at anything in the second trimester, but uh, humbly, I can tell you from a wound healing standpoint, we, we peaked early. So Peter Lorenz, who's a colleague, is taking a genetic approach, working with the Department of Genetics. He's looking at differential expression of genes. This happens to be in mice. Mice are born at 19 and a half days. Up to 17 days, they heal without a scar. After 17 days of the adult, you heal with a scar. And now he's isolated less than 90 genes that are differentially expressed. This could be something you add back to the adult, which is underexpressed relative to a scar-free, or something you take away. So that's one approach to this. But wound healing is one of the most complicated processes in the body, although it's one of the most boring chapters in textbooks, many of which I've written. So I, I apologize to anyone who's already looked at them. But it's hard to make wound healing sexy until we had these molecular techniques. So there's lots of ways you could manipulate a wound. You could think about it. You could use gene therapy. You could put in a scaffold. Renee was talking about the sandbox, the embryo. So might you put something in that stimulates a more ordered repair? That would be fantastic. You could do stem cells. Remember, we just heard about that. Or you could use electrical therapy. If an orthopedic surgeon is having a hard time getting your bone to heal, they sometimes put an electrical current across there, and that stimulates cells uh, to, to go and heal that, wound, uh, that, that bone wound. So, or you could use mechanical forces. Now, mechanical forces is something I'm going to tell you about, because this character right here, Jeff Gertner, who we moved about five years ago from New York University, said, I think mechanics are important. I said, OK, I have no doubt they're important in wound healing. Show me. So he said, OK, this is an incision that was made to take the muscle the, the back muscle, the latissimus dorsi, uh, from a teenage. And you always have pause if you're operating on a 12 or 13-year-old girl that makes me so nervous because of, in that period, they can really overheal. So this was closed with a beautiful, fine incision. right? You could hardly see it. And what's happened is as the, as the, as the person moves around, there's a residual strain. First of all, if you make an incision on a human, it gapes open a little bit, like a football shape. That tells you there's residual strain in the skin. Okay, That's compounded with movement. But look how this scar spread. It was less than a millimeter wide. And now look at it two years later. So there's no question that if you pull across the wound, it'll get thick and it'll spread. This is no big deal. Uh, orthopedic surgeons remind me of this every time I talk to them that if you don't put a cast on, or you don't put a plate on, or whatever it is to mobilize it, that bone won't heal. So there's no question that the mechanical environment dramatically impacts how something heals. So I'm going to teach you how to be a plastic surgeon in the next one minute. There are lines along the body, which were described over a century ago. There are lines where there's minimum tension. We love to make incisions parallel with them. You never make them perpendicular to it unless you don't have to, because the muscles and tension will pull across it, and it'll be a thick scar. OK, so that's what we know. Now, it wasn't in the spirit of what Dean Pizzo said. It wasn't until at a place like Stanford you could begin to ask this question. And I'll just digress for a minute. And I'll clearly state, why is doing research, like Renee said, different at Stanford than MIT Cal Berkeley, or UCSF? Well, the answer is MIT is a fantastic biosciences campus, obviously, without a school of medicine and two hospitals immediately next to it. That's a big advantage for us. And that's an externality that helps us draw scientists to be able to walk across there. Cal Berkeley, similarly, is a gigantic, wonderful university without a school of medicine. And as you've heard, I won't pick on UCSF, UT Southwestern, another health sciences campus where there's no university around it. So having the seven schools here with the School of Medicine and two hospitals is a big advantage. And I'll try to, you, you have, Renee didn't emphasize it, but her work is done with imaging through the linear accelerator, through people with applied physics. It's just a wonderful place to interact where you can cross disciplines. So here's an example of that. You make an incision on a patient. You close that. Now all the 
and if there's an applied physicist or material scientist in here, I apologize, I'll use the term slightly wrong, all the strain, stress, and tension is held by the sutures. And the sutures come out after about a week. Now we got a problem. The problem is you're going to deposit collagen, the sticky material, for about three weeks, and then you're going to make it tighter and tighter like a rope. So at about six to eight weeks, it's about 75% as strong as unwounded skin. Scars are never as strong as unwounded skin because the structure of unwounded skin is as strong as you can make that material. But at six to eight weeks, you can go back to activities of daily living. If you had a hernia operation, you can drive a car, et cetera. So at six to eight weeks, you're about three quarters of the strength you'll be. What if we could offload? So this is a dynamic equilibrium. So this collagen is less strong than the forces that pull across it by the muscles and skin, and it's going to spread until you've reestablished that equilibrium, which takes about two to three months. What if you could offload the mechanical environment and allow the wound, that collagen glue, to get strong enough so it wouldn't spread? That would be a very interesting approach, and would it mean anything? Well, a couple things I haven't told you. I told you that embryos heal without a scar in their very not stiff skin. It's like a gelatinous layer on the outside of the embryo. You absorb things through amniotic fluid like your gut. So they're not stiff at all. Mice, similarly, are really loose skinned. You can pull like a sharp pay. So the first thing the Gertner lab did with our group was to say, OK, if we make human-like strain across a mouse, literally put an erector set on and pull across it, would we get thick scars like we see in humans? The answer is yes. You get 30 times the amount of scarring simply by pulling across the wound with human adult skin-like forces. So that was interesting. So two situations where you don't have stiff skin and you don't have forces, you heal really well. Now, if you're going to test something on wound healing, believe it or not, the most human-like skin are pigs. And it turns out that there's one strain of pigs called purebred red Duroc pigs in Missouri, which heal with a robust scar. So here's an example where Reinhold Doskart, Reiner Doskart is co-chair of material sciences and engineering, a department of the School of Engineering. Absolute expertise is how things stick to skin. Reiner says, well, I can design a material that would stick and offload those forces for you. So here we bring together Jeff Gertner and I are plastic surgeons, Paul Yock, another person you may have heard of, who's a gizmoologist, he says, but he's one of the world's experts in designing devices to try to improve human health. So the four of us come together, and we start to make something. And it looks like any dressing that goes on, except this dressing has material properties that shield the wound. OK, think it may go on big, become smaller, however you want to think of it. I don't even understand it myself. But I'll tell you that if you make an incision on a pig and don't do anything, It'll spread over time. And now, I don't know how you can see this. These are hair follicles. See this white outline? And if you look under the microscope, this black area, on average, is the amount of scarring. If you pull across it, you get a much bigger area of scar and a much bigger area of scar in the microscope. Okay. Now, when the sutures came out of these wounds, at five days, a device went on and stayed on for a week was changed every week. It was hard to keep these on. Turns out pigs are very difficult to handle and mean. <laughs> yes, I, I know that's obvious to some people. I learned a lesson that way. <laughs> so if you're trying to keep a patch on a pig, it's a problem. So now we had to design flak jackets, and it was getting crazy. And they grow about a, a, a pound a day, for heaven's sakes. <laughs> So if you can keep a patch on them for eight weeks, one week at a time, this is after the sutures come out at one week. So this is beginning a week after surgery. We were able to diminish the amount of scarring by 90%. So this is an animal that overheals with human-like scarring that a simple device on the relationship between a material scientist, an engineer, and a device person were able to come up with. So that was fairly interesting. And then this is now, I don't know if it shows, but the left side, well, I won't bias you. Here's the left side is one, the right side is the other. You can determine if you think there are differences in these pig models, the way they're healed. This is where it stops being a science project. The Office of Technology Licensing licenses this out, and it's a startup. If you never hear about it again, it didn't work. But <laughs> the, the only thing I added once it became a startup was, what's, the, what's an incision that's under the most tension in the world? Well, it turns out, believe it or not, it's a tummy tuck. Tummy tuck is about a foot and a half incision, looks like a smile. You remove a lot of skin. The patient doesn't stand up for a couple weeks. So it's under a lot of tension. 
So that would be a challenge to offload that amount of tension. But it's also big, so you can put one side, not the other. And it turns out it's highly significant. The startup company has done 60 or 70 patients already, and it looks very good. Now, the jury's still out. How will the FDA look at it and all that? But there's just an example about how two engineers and two plastic surgeons came together and said, look, something that goes on a week after you're done with your surgery, when your sutures come out, you can still diminish about 80% of your scars. Uh, may be a very big deal or may not be, depending on how it works out. But every time, and I operate on children's faces, and when I used to do a lot of that, that's a big deal. So here's an example of how a multidisciplinary approach having nothing to do with stem cells, it may make a difference for how we all heal. Anyway, that, that's reparative. Now, Renee told you that stem cells are hot, and here's our esteemed leader, <laughs> Irv Weissman, with, he wanted me to emphasize hunderite chickens, which are very fatty, and he seemed to be having some trouble with them on the barbecue. Um, but he's, he's fine, and the meal was fine. Let me reassure you, there was no injury. Although it does look a little worrisome, doesn't it? Yeah. No one was called on his campus. There was no fire or anything. He made it. Well, that was a strategic advantage, though. There. OK, so you hear about stem cells, and I'm reminded of this picture, the Fountain of Youth. By the way, I do want to point out something. Look carefully. Okay, what I think is it's very, it's very gender biased if you look carefully, right? You'd think only females benefit from stem cells if you look carefully, which was my only reason for put it, putting that up. <laughs> I'll fast forward. Obviously, this is the last lecture. If you guys know everything I'm saying, we'll just end it now. <laughs> but there are some things that we haven't talked about, and Renee alluded to, and there have been some stumbles along the way, right? Your so-called academic misconduct in Korea, remember that? Well, we had them for 10 days here, and that, that was disappointing. And that, for the naysayers, gave a lot of fodder. But we worked through that. I'll talk a little bit, a little bit more about how the viruses that you use to get genes into cell, well, you remember child, boy or girl in the bubble, when you reestablish their immune system, they can have an integration, not how you want it in the genome. And those children can develop leukemia and die from that. So getting the Trojan horse to be benign is a big deal. And then, as Renee has alluded to, are they really a free pass? Can I take a human embryonic stem cell, put it in my body, or reprogram something and put it back in my body even though it was for me? These are issues that the field is, needs to work on. And then, as she talked about, without any coaching at all, you can't put these cells back in because they'll develop into a teratoma. You've got to get them towards what you want them to be. Medical tourism is something that I think is very important to at least uh, alert you to. This is a, uh, from last year, this is a child with a neurodegenerative disease who had fetal, not hum embryonic, uh, fetal human neural stem cells injected into the brain or into the water, so-called around the brain, and developed multiple tumors. And those tumors were shown to be from donors, not from the cells. In other words, the cells that were put in. So we need to understand how to control those cells becoming what you want them to be, as Renee talked about, versus doing their own thing. So there are you know, some issues that we need to work out, but, but we're getting there. OK. Now, I'm from the Midwest. You guys are in great shape. Our dean has run many, many marathons. <laughs> but a great natural and recurring source of, of harvested tissue is fat in America. It turns out that this is about uh, two or 300,000 people a year have their fat removed in Palo Alto. It's liquid gold. I made the mistake of calling it that. Um, uh, it comes to our laboratory because that it's otherwise thrown out as medical waste. It turns out you can spin that down. And Renee talked about the middle layer, the middle layer, the mesoderm, so muscle, bone, cartilage, ligament, tendon, fat, the middle layer. So there's about a billion multipotent cells per liter of fat. The average liposuction, believe it or not, is about three liters. So that's about 3 billion cells to start with, which is a big deal if you need a lot of cells. So it turns out that we've been working with these cells. And there's lots of different cell types. You saw in Renee's slides that like 10% may be positive or something. So what are the cells that are in fat? It turns out they're a smooth muscle cell that's surrounding blood vessels in fat. They're not the fat cells themselves. Okay, But there are a lot of them. And maybe these are the mesenchymal stem cell for the body. There are three papers that have come out in the last year. We'll see. But they certainly give us a strategic advantage to work with. So the first thing we did is say, look, if these are a billion cells per liter, and they can go to muscle, bone, cartilage, ligament, tendon, whatever you need, 
if we put them in the right sandbox, so to speak, with the right environment, a scaffold, a sponge-like material, through our bioengineering colleagues, they would design it such that it was coated with things that would mimic bone. So if the cells are on there, they'll get a strong signal to differentiate to bone. Now, being a craniofacial surgeon, we never have enough bone. That's a thing it's hard, it's hard to imagine. But if you do that, would they heal the defect? So this is a 3D CT, which you're from, probably seen lots of these if you've had any imaging. But there's a hole in the right side of the skull. Here are the cheekbones. Here's the snout. Here's the spine. This will never heal in the lifetime of the animal. But if you put human-derived fat cells that are multipotent, and you put them on something that it looks and feels like calcium, like a bone mineral, they'll regenerate that defect even faster than bone marrow or bone cells will. So clearly, they're capable of regenerating a defect that would never heal. Now, not in America, but as I sit here, we put on a meeting in San Francisco called Technologies and Innovations in Plastic Surgery last week. Multiple, multiple places in Europe they're aspirating out this fat, and they're using it either to regenerate skeletal defects, as opposed to not having enough bone to borrow from in the body, or they're reconstructing breasts after mastectomy using this approach. So the idea of fat-derived stem cells going to either skeleton or bone is arriving in Europe. There's a, a surgeon presented over 1,000 cases. Um, not here for the United States because there'd be concern about whether you would see the same things on mammography. You'd be concerned about of having a recurrent cancer. So, but it is coming in Europe, and it's a great source of cells if you need the middle layer of the embryo, so to, uh, of, of, the, of the body, so to speak. So at Stanford, we'd like to think we could do bedside tissue engineering. That is, Let's say a surgeon, what do we do a lot of? Uh, hip replacement, knee replacement. It seems kind of crazy that you cut that out, cut out the disease joint, glue it in, and then give the patient antibiotics whenever they have their teeth cleaned or whatever the rest of their life, and hope that the, that integrates and in, in lasts 10 or 15 years. Wouldn't it be great if we could get bone to reform in there or have something over about a three-year period form bone where you need it and cartilage where you need it simply by coaching local factors? So you'd be regenerating and replacing a bioengineered construct with your own tissue over time rather than gluing in titanium. Now, that, that's a very effective way to do it. But what we'd like to do is say, OK, we can aspirate some fat on anyone in a matter of minutes and then give it to whoever needs it. For example, heart surgeons. Renee mentioned it's from the middle layer. So there are over 12,000 patients who have had bone marrow injected in their heart around the world. Would fat, which was another thing I heard about last week in Europe, would fat in Japan and Europe be another source of cells that could become those heart cells? I'm not saying they are. I'm just saying there's a lot of act activity about it. So you'd go right back into that patient in the operating room without leaving. That's an advantage with the FDA, because you don't have to leave the operating room. Yes? So do you, would this go into the same person? Yes. So, so aspirate on that patient and in, in that operation. If you don't leave the operating room, and this is, um, thank you for asking the point, this is a big deal. In nine years of general surgery, where we're operating on trauma and hearts and stomachs, so someone has a gunshot wound to the liver and you maybe lose 50 units of blood at San Francisco General, we save that blood, spin it down, and put it back in that patient. Now that's crazy because of the products that could be in that blood that could stimulate clots to form or not form, but if you don't leave the operating room, the FDA has a much lower bar. So be, this would be autogenous. Aspirate fat, go right back into that patient for whatever the indication is. Ideally, it's that middle layer, ligaments and tendons, et cetera. Now, surgeons need more than mesoderm. Renee talked about this. What if you don't need ligament, tendon, bone, but you need hair or nerves or thyroid or lung or pancreas? Now what do you do? Fat is a lot of it, but a lot of something that doesn't help you isn't very good. So the strategy there is this induced pluripotent cells that Renee talked about. So we're going to th go through this quickly because this will be like a refresher now, right? You're going to hear it again. <laughs> then you can give this talk. In surgery, or see one, do one, teach one. <laughs> so I'll give you these slides. You guys will be all set for the next one. <laughs> Not really. We don't do that at Stanford. It's, been, it's a very graduated approach where over time, over time, I don't want to be quoted on that one. OK. So, Mom, it's, it, it's just an unusual night. I'm sorry. 
So this is that sort of landscape that Rene so elegantly described over the past three, four, uh, first three, four, five, six, seven days. Well, you got to make decisions. But the question here is, we want to go backwards. So if I ask you to drive out of your driveway and go and end up in um, Fenway Park, there's lots of ways you could do that. But once you drive into Fenway Park, you're committed. So how you would reprogram and how you'd get there, there's lots of choices. And she described it. There's almost infinite numbers. But the field has moved forward. And now, as Renee said, that you could take something and reprogram it back to where you could be not just in the middle layer. So now the potential of fat or bone marrow or skin or whatever becomes a lot more exciting, a lot more exciting. Now there are two problems I want to emphasize because she set the table very nicely. You do this and you have these three factors. It's a little bit like name that tune. Now you can do one factor. First it was four, then it was three, then it was two. Sometimes it could be one. But however you get those Trojan horses in, how you get those reprogramming factors in, you want to make sure they're not going to cause a problem and do insertional mutagenesis and cause a cancer or something like that. So that's the first problem. The second thing is, once you reprogram these little guys and gals back, now they can become anything. If you try to use them, they're like my two young boys in Toys R Us. They're very, very unorganized when you have them make a decision. <laughs> They're OK for about 10 seconds, and then it's overwhelming. So you can't put them in when they have unlimited choice, because they'll become a benign tumor, like I showed you in that, that CT scan. So you've got to coach them to what you need. That's pretty tricky. Renee's lab and thousands of others are trying exactly how would you do that for pancreas, or how would you do that for heart muscle. So the coaching aspect is not well worked out. This is a gentleman, Joe Wu, speaking of. So Joe Wu trained with Sam Gambier, and I, I imagine that Sam spoke last week. So this, Joe is a person who did his MD, PhD with Sam at UCLA, came up. He's a cardiologist. Turns out he also is, is, is a testament to what we can do here. We do such a good job with children at Packard that, God willing, they become adults. Joe is actually a congenital adult cardiologist. We do such a fabulous job of correcting things that uh, those children did not live into adulthood. Now we have a whole service of them. So Joe is actually working right in the middle of kids and adults for having adults who have lived to have congenital heart disease. So it's a very interesting story. But anyway, Joe said, look, if you get a lot of fat, let me reprogram it. Because I think if you said it can become muscle, bone, cartilage, ligament, tendon, et cetera, that's a lot of choices. Maybe it's already backed up a bit, more than a skin cell that can be one, one thing. So Joe's idea was to do that because he thought, OK, here's a, let's say this is a skin cell, a fibroblast. Here's a adipose-derived stromal cell. This can become lots of things. It's beginning to look a lot more like something upstream. Maybe it would be easier to reprogram. So uh, Rene has elegantly set the table. You immediately recognize what this is. Um, you immediately recognize what this is. It's a teratoma. So we put it subcutaneously into a mouse without immune system. And guess what happened? It's disorganized. And it's got all the three layers, hair, bone, teeth, whatever. Um, so it happens. But the interesting thing is we're able to reprogram day one. Because we start with 3 billion cells, it would take about three to four weeks from a skin biopsy to grow up those cells before you had enough cells to reprogram. With this, we're reprogramming one day. So it takes half as long. And it turns out it's 20 times more efficient. So Joe was right. And that was a very interesting story, um, emphasizing that this is a collaboration with Bobby Robbins and Joe Wu's lab, my lab, lots of people. So this was a paper that was published earlier this year. Now, there are two problems, you said, not so fast. One is integrating viruses causing cancer, to be blunt, right? So how do we handle that? Renee alluded to it. Here's an example of something that could only be done at Stanford. So Mark Kay, who's one of our co-directors of gene therapy, is also a pediatrician and a geneticist. Mark Kay had developed something for a different reason that doesn't integrate. So this Trojan horse, it's not going to cause a problem. It doesn't get in for a little bit, and then we take it out. It never has the ability to integrate. And it turns out that this, this called mini-circle plasma DNA was also by, by just putting in the, the factors that we needed to. And this was very interesting, because you can put equal dosages in, or you can change the order. There's a lot more to this. But with Marquet's approach, we were able to reprogram as efficient, almost as efficiently as we could with the more standard viruses. And this was, uh, again, a, a multi-lab collaboration, where Stanford now comes forward with a way that doesn't cause the cancer problem. So 
I then want to say, okay, so that is an example of how you would handle one of the problems of avoiding an integration and causing a cancer. Marius Wernig, uh, along with Tom Sudoff and, and other people from Stanford, is a very recent recruit into the Stem Cell Institute from MIT. Marius is also an MD, a pathologist, I believe. Um, and Marius said, look, I want to avoid kind of backing all the way up and then figuring out how to coach it. So what Marius did is he and Tom Sudoff's group were able to reprogram directly from a skin fibroblast to a neuron. So now you can think, wow, that's really great. If you don't integrate, you avoid all the problems of that. If you don't have to back it up and then re-coach it. So now you have just an example where in the last year, Stanford Labs, collaborating across the campus, are trying to address the problems that were so elegantly stated by Renee in the field. That is, these are significant barriers or not, depending on how we solve them, to moving forward. The advantage of having the autologous source of cells, as she said, would get them back in you in a, in a way that's safe. So here's an example of that. Yes? So the reason that you could do that, go from a skin to a neuron, is because they're both mesoderm, is that the idea? Or both extraderm? Yeah, but, look, repeat the question first, is the reason we could do that, go from a skin fibroblast, middle layer, mesoderm, to a neuron, which is actually ectoderm, is that you, you were, they, I think they started with 19 factors. So they, they made a complicated analysis and got it down to seven or eight. So they were able to reprogram directly and get it out, it, it went outside a mesoderm. So nerve is the outer layer, like skin, like hair. Um, and so this is the concept, whether you're, um, as Renee has talked about. Okay, I'm gonna finish here because I wanna leave time for some questions and we don't have a lot of time. So this is the most, second most common birth defect in the world. So we talked about how you heal wounds. We talked a little bit about how you might use an adult stem cell and how you might use an adult stem cell that's readily available. Now, how about preventing a birth defect? Out at the other end of the spectrum. Well, this is about one in 500 to one in 1,000 children. Um, and as a craniofacial surgeon, these children need an average of 12, 13, 14 operations on the lip, on the palate, on the nose, on the speech, on the tubes, on the ears, a lot. Fundamentally, the biggest problem is they don't quite look normal because of the scar. We can get them looking very normal in the operating room, but there's a scarring effect here. Now, this uh, young woman here named Karen Liu is an example of why Stanford's different. So Karen is a graduate of Princeton who is working on Wall Street as an architect. Didn't realize there wasn't a lot of people involvement in that doing the CAD CAM design. Bored out of her mind, said, I, this is not what I signed up for. I'm sure she was making a lot of money, but she, was, she wasn't very happy. Karen went to night school at Columbia and eventually made it into the Developmental Biology PhD program at Berkeley, where she worked on frog development. So Karen applied to something that Renee helped me do several years ago, which is an interdisciplinary program in regenerative medicine. So Karen came to me and interviewed and said, I want to work with your lab, a chemistry lab, and a developmental biology lab, Jerry Crabtree's lab. I want to design a small molecule that will go through the blood system of mom, go into the embryo, and, and prevent a birth defect. <laughs> so wanting to, wanting to be erudite, I said, yes, yes, I, I've been wanting to do that too. <laughs> And I, I've waited my whole life to see you. She got the job, she linked the labs, and she did the story. So now she's running a lab in London. She's very successful, but it was entirely her idea. Now, you hear a lot about gene, turning genes on and turning genes off in proteins. So her concept was if she gave a drug to mom, it would go through the blood system, through the placenta, into the embryo, and do something to stabilize a protein, turn on a protein that would otherwise not be available to the embryo. So that's the concept. You turn it on, as opposed to doing 10,000 little injections in an ultrasound, for example, you could never do this. She wanted to turn it on whenever it was being made. We talked about timing and location and wherever it was being made. Jerry Crabtree is an example of a developmental biologist. Uh, uh, National Academy member, lots of interesting ideas. So the, he's an example of someone who the student brought together. That's the key. The students want to link different labs together. I can't even find my desk. They don't care about their desk. They're on the internet. They're working in three or four different labs. So Karen said, I'm going to take GSK3 beta, um, which sounds a little bit like alphabet soup, but 
you know, as, a, as we're looking at social networks, if this were a Facebook page, it'd be a lot of friends on this baby right here. <laughs> this does a lot in the nucleus, in the cytoplasm, turns things on, turns things off. So if you were to futz with it a bit, you'd see a big problem just by how many interactions it has. Karen put a handle on it, which made it unstable. So if you don't give drug, it's going to immediately be degraded. The body will never see it. But if you gave a drug, in this case it was a molecular analog of rapamycin, which is used for other things, it would stabilize the protein. So now, if you gave drug to mom during an eight hour window of development, remember mice develop over 19 and a half days, we could stabilize a protein. So palate development 101, pretend I've had a guillotine go through my head like this. Here is the lower jaw, the tongue, here's the nose. The palate separates your mouth from your nose. If you have a cleft palate, and you're looking this way, you don't see the palate. Does everyone see that? That happens in two days, between about 12 and a half days and 14 and a half days of the 19, precisely. 48 hours, the palate develops. So her concept was, OK, I'm going to first show you that if I don't, now, this is the only other weird thing I'm going to ask you to do tonight, is pretend like you're lying on the ground and look up at your palate or feel it with your tongue. Those ridges you feel here are right here. Here are the teeth, here are the tonsils. This is intact. Now, if you have a cleft, you see the hole or the gap between the two. This is if you knock the gene out in a traditional way. The embryo's never had it. But if you don't give drug during those, that time, you also develop a cleft palate. So Karen said, aha, uh -huh, I'm going to give a drug. It's going to stabilize GSK3 beta whenever and whenever, wherever the embryo is going to be making it. So the results were beyond what we could have hoped for. This is my favorite slide tonight. <laughs> I know Renee had a different one. This is my favorite slide tonight um, that, that we're able to rescue from a cleft to an intact palate simply by giving this drug. But the most amazing thing from a developmental biology standpoint, the embryo, as she was saying, when it's ready, it would only be rescued during the 48 hours it was developing the palate. You gave it before it wouldn't work, after it wouldn't work. Now, superimposed on that, the sternum does between 15 and 17 days. Again, the embryo could not be rescued with the drug, no operation or anything, without, uh, only during the two days it was developing. So Karen was right. If you want to read more about it, this was published uh, a couple years ago in, in, uh, in, in one of the journals. Now, so I've talked about how you repair, how you might replace using cells or how you might prevent a birth defect. That was a very complicated setup where we knew those animals could develop a cleft. So I don't want anyone to walk out saying we're ready to do this tomorrow at the children's hospital. But it is an important first step. And as Renee said, look, it may take 20 or 30 years before we're growing a new kidney, or, or if ever. First of all, it'd have to be a bioreactor the size of the state of California right now. But we'll, we'll, get, it, we'll get it smaller than that. But there's lots of other things looking to, at what's wrong in those. Uh, remember she showed the, the slide where um, about the Parkinson's, about the precursor to what's going to be a problem? That would be important. She's too modest, but her laboratory, Eric Shaw's lab and my laboratory, have a very big phenotype on, a pre uh, on, a, on an embryonic stem cell from Marfan syndrome. So more to come on that, because we treat those patients all the time by replacing their aorta. So working with Renee, we hope to next year give you an update on, on, on that phenotype. So I think I'll stop by saying regenerative medicine is not a new approach being multidisciplinary. If you go to the cancer center, you have a tumor board. This is something where uh, physicians are, are interacting all the time. We just want to take advantage of the explosion of knowledge here on this campus with seven schools in the Silicon Valley and beyond. We could leverage this not one operation at a time. I said they're 80 million a year, but you know, that's not always doing it. Just build on what we'd accomplish. I don't want to put ourselves out of business, but I do want to say <laughs> that clinicians and scientists, the opportunity to collaborate with someone like Renee, makes Stanford a special place. And I think Stanford will continue to be in a leadership position because of that culture where we work together. I think I'll stop there. Well, thank you, uh, Michael, and thank you, Renee. And you've heard it over and over again. Uh, this is a special place. I hope you uh, understand now why it is such a special place. Um, uh, it is, uh, really, to me, a, a unique environment. 
And it is because of the people. Um, and you've heard many of them over these last 30 sessions, and they're just a subset of those who are here uh, working so diligently and so hard. So I want to thank uh, again Mike and uh, Renee for their presentation. And I just saw Charlie come in, who is uh, the leader of this whole uh, continuing studies program. And he slipped me a note earlier saying that he wanted to have the final word. I, I don't like to give the final word to anybody. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I know better than that. Uh, after all, this is his program. So thank you all. It's been terrific. Well, no surprise. Um, I actually um, have been able to come to a lot of these classes during uh, fall and winter, but my own teaching schedule conflicted with uh, your spring uh, classes. And so I came over here uh, 10 to 7, thinking that I'd catch the beginning of your course, and of course forgot that you start at 6.30. Um, and I missed you. But I'm glad you're going to allow me just one minute uh, to say a few words of thanks um, on the, this occasion, the last class of the 2009-2010 uh, Stanford Mini Medical School course, which was, I think you all know uh, and appreciate how extraordinary it is. And I want to take this moment to uh, extend on your behalf and on behalf of Continuing Studies, which was the junior partner in this endeavor throughout the whole year, um, on our collective behalf, um, a, a, an expression of deep gratitude and thanks to Phil Pizzo and Kathy Gillum. <laughs> Not as good at public speaking as Phil, so I have to read. And this can be like a, um, what's it called, the um, State of the Union address. You can interrupt as often as you like with applause, okay? <laughs> <laughs> so tonight marks the end of a marathon, and, um, and I suspect that both Phil and Kathy uh, feel a, a deep sense of relief as the finish line uh, comes into sight. But I hope that uh, you both also feel uh, deep gratification, personal gratification, uh, for the scope and the magnitude of your accomplishment. I can say that in my 15 years at Continuing Studies, I've never experienced a course as ambitious, thoughtful, articulate, and inspiring as Minimed has been. <laughs> to say that you've established a new gold standard is an understatement. But to say that every uh, one of the 30 lectures left 250 rapt students leaving the auditorium inspired and exhilarated is just the truth. So this will be uh, the philosophers say description of the obvious, right? Night after night, they've expressed their gratitude with applause uh, at a <laughs> <laughs> impressive decibels and, and duration. Uh, surely that gratitude was in response to the intelligence, skill, depth of knowledge of the presenters uh, and the inspiring scope and breadth of information that the presenters delivered um, on the subject at hand. But I also know um, that a part of that applause, a good part of it, every time was an expression of gratitude for the incredible generosity uh, that the two of you have shown by proposing this course in the first place designing it from scratch, recruiting the very, very best speakers from your entire faculty, and then hosting it for 30 nights running fall, winter, and spring. So nothing can be put in a box and gift wrapped uh, that can match the gift you've given us. But we hope that when you get home and open your presents, you will hear in your memory the echoes of those many nights of applause and know how abiding is the heartfelt thanks of each and every one of us who have had the educational experience of a lifetime with you this year. So thank you very much. For <laughs> Thank you.
Okay, well, that's it. Thank you all for being here. And if you have questions, I think Mike and Renee will take them. Good luck in your future. Keep learning. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.